Um, Jim, now tell our tell our viewers a little bit about how the genesis of your most recent book, uh, how that came to be, and then we'll maybe look at your books just prior to that. Well, Dan, it's great to, to see yes, you again. Yes, good to see you. Yes. And I'm here at uh, Western. Western is my alma mater. Yes. I graduated here 49 years ago. Yes. And then I have an honorary doctorate here as well. So I have a lot of strong ties to this uh, uh, university and I'm glad to be back. And I'm giving a, a speech uh, uh, later on today. I uh, have been through many uh, transformations in my life. I went to Western, I taught high school for a little while, then I spent 35 years in the Canadian Foreign Service mm -hmm. in, uh, on six different continents. Uh, I was ambassador or high commissioner in about seven or eight different countries. And then I was lieutenant governor. Yes. And in recent years, since I retired, I retired as lieutenant governor uh, five years ago. And since that time, I've devoted myself to writing. Uh, and when I was lieutenant governor, I focused very much on the issues of mental health, anti-racism, and the well-being of Native children. Now that I am no longer in the position of Lieutenant Governor, I can't mobilize the same resources and do the same sort of things that I could as a Lieutenant Governor, but I can write. And I've written a, a book called, as lo a novel called As Long As the Rivers Flow, which in a sense is a summary of uh, all the years I spent as Lieutenant Governor traveling in the North, uh, working with uh, Native kids, and at that time, I had been terribly shocked and uh, saddened by the fact that uh, there has been an epidemic of suicide among the Native youth in the northern part of the province, in the two-thirds of the province, which is called the Anishinaabe Nation, Anishinaabe Aski Nation. Mm -hmm. um, and this suicide epidemic has been going on since 1987 about 20 young people kill themselves every year. Mm -hmm. And what I ascertained was that one of the major reasons that these kids give up and die, many of them when they just turn to puberty, is because of the residual effects of the residential school experience. And let me explain. Mm -hmm. For a hundred years, uh, Native children were taken away from their parents and sent to residential schools where they were raised uh, in institutions, sort of cross between orphanages and prisons, mm -hmm. uh, where the children uh, were taken out of their loving families and put into these places where no one ever said they loved them, where they were uh, in too many cases, abused sexually and physically, where uh, they forgot how families operated or worked. And when they left the schools after 10 years, they had no idea how to raise children. Mm -hmm. But they did have children. And their children went back to, went, were taken away again for 10 years. And that went on in cycle after cycle after cycle mm -hmm. in the longest sustained uh, application of racial discrimination in this country. A mm -hmm. uh, hundred years in which children were taken away and nobody seemed to care. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is that even though the residential school uh, closed 20, 25 years ago, the broken families remain. Mm -hmm. and the broken families because of the residential school experience where the children never learned, where, where the children uh, were not raised in a family environment and therefore were not good parents, didn't know how to raise their parents. They abused their children in many, too many mm -hmm. cases. Too many cases of children you know, being ha having to be taken by uh, uh, welfare authorities, child welfare authorities. And so uh, it was the residential school experience which has brought about this huge tragedy. And the kids, when they hit 13 or so, they've been raised not in a loving environment. 
they don't know how to cope. And when they go out into the outside world or where they watch TV, they see that they're not welcome. And uh, they go to schools. In, in their schools, uh, they discover that when they go to school, they don't ha there, there are no uh, special education teachers. There are no libraries and no sports mm -hmm. equipment. The teachers that they have may be well-meaning, but they're the most junior possible because the native communities are, uh, receive only about 80% for the education of their children as non-native kids, mm -hmm. as non-native uh, communities. Mm -hmm. So they're consistently uh, underfunded. Mm -hmm. When a school burns down, and uh, this happens all too often because in these communities there are no, fi no money for fire departments. Mm -hmm. uh, the schools may not be rebuilt for 25 years, mm -hmm. and nobody seems to care. And so I thought I would try and uh, write a novel which would show the good and the bad in all of us, and the good and the bad of governments, and the, what happens when you try to apply a formula. The formula of the 19th century was take the native children from their parents, put them in these residential schools, teach them to read and write and to believe and think like white people, and they will be assimilated into the white world. But it was a huge failure. All you ended up doing was destroying the family structures. Mm -hmm. it's, you can say that and, you can, and, and, you, and people will nod. You can write theses about it and it'll end up on academic shelves. But if you can write a novel about it to show how the residential schools really impacted on the life of an individual, then you can change minds. And that's why I did that. Mm. And so I wrote my book, Random House Can Off, put it out mm -hmm. last year. And it has been doing very well. My goal was not to make money. My goal was to continue to try to make a contribution to understanding about what was going on in the Native communities. And the hardcover version sold out, and it's on about the third version of the paperback. Good. And it's being adopted by uh, universities and high schools, and, uh, and I'm glad about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, literacy, which was one of your, uh, one of the uh, touchstones which you wanted to, to, to use to utilize in your, uh, as Lieutenant Governorship uh, of Ontario, that was, uh, as you said, mental health. Uh, anti-racism. And anti-racism and uh, literacy, or the youth, native youth of the North. So literacy you found to be a very uh, welcome gesture. Yes, yes. I, uh, when I was Lieutenant Governor, I, there's a lot of people of goodwill in mm -hmm. the province. That's and right. so the first thing I did was to, uh, uh, launch a, mm -hmm. a huge book drives and I collected uh, something like 2.2 million books. Wow. We sorted them down to a million and a half. Mm -hmm. I had no budget for it, didn't want a budget, I wanted it to be done all by volunteers. And we established libraries in First Nation communities across the province. Mm -hmm. And then I went out and raised money for summer literacy camps. Mm -hmm. And for the past seven years uh, we've been running seven, uh, 40 camps up in these isolated communities. Mm -hmm. We sent about 100 uh, Frontier, uh, 100 university students up every summer. Mm -hmm. Frontier College runs it. I turned oh. over all the money to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chiefs uh, provide about 100 of their young people to work with, the ones coming from the south. Mm -hmm. I established a book club for all the children in the remote flying communities. It's 26 remote communities, mm -hmm. and uh, there's 5,000 kids there from kindergarten to grade uh, six, and they receive brand new books uh, for their own private little libraries um, every three months. Mm -hmm. Good. And then I, the Premier established a literary, at my request, a literary prizes for Aboriginal children, yes. and so we issue six $2,500 prizes every year toward the uh, education of uh, some kids. Mm -hmm. I've been retired as Lieutenant Governor five years, uh, but I am 
my, the money I raised uh, has kept these programs going since I uh, retired, and I'm now becoming involved once again and uh, trying to ensure that these programs carry on into the future. And I met last week with uh, the Grand Chief Stan Beardy of the Anishinaabe mm -hmm. Aski Nation, yes. and we're going to work together and with people of goodwill to uh, maintain uh, the uh, book clubs. And we're not, however, we d I, don't lo I no longer have the means of, of uh, organizing big book drives, so I'm not collecting mm -hmm. books. Okay. Uh, uh, because before, you know, it, it, it was a pretty daunting prospect to see, uh, you know, uh, a million books in huge hangars. Say, oh, what am I, how am I going to get these up north mm -hmm. when you don't have any money? Mm -hmm. So I really had to scramble to uh, get uh, so many volunteers to sort, and then the military came in and helped, and then Wasse Airlines. Oh, yeah. They put they they provided about five hundred thousand dollars in uh, support, and that's what it would have cost to yeah. fly these books into many of the places. Mm -hmm. the military parachuted books into some communities, but mm -hmm. I no longer have this sort of access. So I'm going to focus very much on summer reading camps. Um, uh, uh, that that that's the the main focus: summer reading camps and the book club for young children. Mm -hmm. And, and then on my, si on my own, writing my novels. I've written another novel, which is in the hands of my publisher. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they're going to publish it or not, but, if, uh, but somebody will. Yes, and that's to add to your collection of uh, another four, four or five novels that you've written? I've since? written four, non four nonfiction books okay. and uh, one novel, and now I've written the second novel. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So do you, you mentioned these this situation, it's, which is uh, uh, kind of deplorable about uh, Canada's history, you, do you mention these when you are at, uh, you're giving an address for the International Day to Eliminate Racism? Of course. You, you mentioned, that's good because that's the way to educate the public. Yes, last week uh, I was invited by uh, the, uh, the organization on Thunder Bay, which is called Diversity, mm -hmm. at which uh, has been put together to deal with, discuss the issue of racism in Thunder Bay. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's worse there than anywhere else, but they yes. want to, they want to be stay ahead of it. Mm -hmm. So they invited me. <coughs> so I went up last week and I spoke to about 500 people, and there were a lot of uh, Native people present. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, I found it uh, very educational. There was uh, a lot of uh, young not necessarily young, but native professional people, uh, teachers, drug uh, uh, counselors, uh, uh, librarians, and what all. Mm -hmm. And do you know what they said to the group of people that were there? Mm -hmm. They said, everybody looks upon me as a drunken Indian bum. They don't oh. understand that I'm a human being just like they are. Mm -hmm. They assume because I am, I have brown skin. They assume that I must be of some sort of bum. Mm -hmm. This is a stereotype that we have to fight. Mm -hmm. And yes. they were, they were very passionate about it. And I can understand. Mm -hmm. Here they are, these people who have fought so hard to get an education and be leaders in their community. And when they go walking, they're walking, you know, to the to buy a loaf of bread or something. They're called uh, bad names and all that sort of stuff. When uh, when uh, through stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for uh, doing this with us. Okay. We appreciate it very Pleasure. much, brother.